So uh, thank you very much, Dora, for having me. Thank you for being here. Um, so I am the, so Maria Loni, and I'm a researcher and lecturer at the ILLC, Logic, Institute of Logic, Language, and Computation, and at the Department of Philosophy. In both institutions, I am part of this logic and language group. And indeed, the, the topic of my uh, presentation today will be on the relation between logic and language. I will first uh, start by saying something about uh, the field of formal semantics that, as Dora said, uses logic to arrive at predictive models of linguistic meanings. Uh, and then I will uh, uh, look at the case of free choice inferences that are considered to be challenging for the, for the field. I, I will explain why. And then we will look at different strategies that we can uh, uh, use to deal with this challenge, and I will propose my own strategy, my own proposal. Okay. Now, uh, formal semantics. As said, formal semantics uh, uses logic to analyze uh, meanings from natural language, so languages like English, Dutch, Mandarin, and other. It has its roots in the philosophy of language, in the work of people like uh, uh, Frege, uh, Russell, and Wittgenstein. Maybe you might have heard some of these names. But also in theoretical linguistics, in particular in the generative tradition. So the tradition of generative grammar, uh, uh, which was championed by Noam Chomsky, maybe also someone that you have heard before. Uh, there are two, uh, two figures that are very important in the history of formal semantics. One is Richard Montague, this guy here. Uh, who at the beginning of the 70s pioneered uh, the use of logic to explain linguistic meanings. Um, and then uh, the second figure is Barbara Partee, uh, who managed to put together these two traditions. So Barbara Partee was uh, a student of Chomsky at MIT. And then after uh, getting her PhD, she went at, uh, in Los Angeles at UCLA and worked together with Montague, and then she brought together the two tradition on one side, theoretical linguistics, the generative syntax, and uh, logic and philosophy, and then established uh, then uh, the field uh, of formal semantics as an independent, flourishing, interdisciplinary field of research. And then semantics is one of the few fields uh, uh, which doesn't have a founding father, but has a founding mother, and this is already very nice. <laughs> So then, the, um, so formal semantic studies meanings, linguistic meanings, but the question is what, what are meanings? What is meaning? And this is a, an important question, but also a difficult one. It's important, it has been a crucial in philosophy in the last, since the work of these guys here in the last century, in particular in the analytical tradition in philosophy. It's been important in theoretical linguistics after uh, people like Parti put then meanings and formal semantics into the agenda of theoretical linguistics. But nowadays, it's also starting to play a crucial role also in these new disciplines, computational linguistics, artificial intelligence, in general, cognitive science. And uh, so I said it's a difficult question, and as all difficult questions, I think you will learn this, it's very hard to uh, grasp them and uh, arrive at full understanding unless we put together ideas from different disciplines. And so this field of formal semantics, which studies meaning, is really a, an interdisciplinary uh, field. Uh, now, formal semanticists uh, normally do acknowledge the difficulty of the question, and indeed, uh, even they didn't, don't even try to arrive at a direct answer. Normally what they would say is that no direct answer to such a question is possible, and normally they, what they will produce as an answer to this question are whole theories. And this is, uh, um, and th then normally what they also do, they do observe a parallelism between the questions like one, what is meaning, with the difficult theoretical questions from the empirical science, for example, question like what is electricity, what is light, and the observation is the following. So physicists, so researchers in physics, were in opposition to say what electricity was or what light was before they, do, they did two things. 
first, before they identified a, a number of phenomena where so light or electricity would show itself, phenomena that had to do with the light, had to do with electricity. And second, before they developed theories that made prediction about this phenomena. And this is also what we expect then from a former semanticist. Uh, first, collect a number of data where meaning shows itself, semantic facts, and then develop theories that make predictions about these facts. And so the, the starting point for a former semanticist is normally not the question what is meaning in general, but is more in what phenomena can we find uh, uh, meaning showing itself and therefore then co we constitute the empirical scope of the field. So, so what are semantic facts? What are semantic phenomena? And this is again a difficult question because what are meanings? Think about it. What, what are they? It's not something that we can observe. It's not something that we hear. Huh? Now, so if you have had some introduction to theoretical linguistics, you will know that normally linguistic evidence, at least in the generative tradition, in the work of Chomsky, has been identified with the judgment on well-formedness. For instance, so we have syntax. So syntax is a part of linguistics, which studies how words can be put together to form sentences. And now in syntax, uh, the data, typical data, are like the pairs in six. So they are minimal pairs. The first one, Lear had three daughters, is an example of a well-formed sentence. And the second one had three Lear daughters, ill-formed. So these are the data, things that we can see, observe. And then uh, the syntactic theory then is a set of rules or something that would make prediction about this data. And then you check. They should predict for the A sentence that is OK and for the B sentence that is out. And so that, this is what you would expect from a syntactic theory. Now, in, in, in phonetics and phonology, similarly, where they study the sounds and sound patterns, so you find this example of minimal pairs. So something is OK and the other is not OK, and you want to make the right prediction. But now, what about meanings? So st semantic studies meanings. And again, meanings are not things that you can observe, not things that you hear. What are they? Now, in the old days, so Chomsky himself uh, came up with this kind of uh, um, pairs uh, illustrating semantic evidence. Uh, examples in eight, so we have in 8a, we have happy young children sleep quietly. This is an example of a, a good sentence. And then in 8b, this is a famous example from Chomsky, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. There is something weird with this sentence, a bit odd, strange. Uh, um, linguists call them anom anomalous. Uh, we could say that, so from a, a grammatical point of view, there is nothing wrong with 8b. Uh, it, says, it has the same grammatical syntactic form of 8a, but still it's odd, it's odd. And so then in the old days, they thought, well, this is, there must be something wrong with the meaning of the sentence. These are then uh, semantic data. Huh? So while 8a is semantically and syntactically well-formed, 8b is syntactically well-formed, but semantically not well-formed. Okay? So this is an example of a semantic data, semantic fact that you will want to uh, explain. Normally, these data are uh, addressed nowadays in lexical semantics, which is uh, one part of semantics which deals with the meaning of individual words. And what is, so how can we explain what is wrong about B? It's somehow part of the meaning of sleep, a verb like sleep, that you cannot do it in a furious way. And it's part of the meaning of sleep also that it requires a, a subject which is animate. And ideas are not such a thing. Eh? So this will, so, so then you try to figure out and write uh, theories that somehow uh, res reflect this intuition, and you arrive at theories that manage to account for the contrast between A and B. But these are not the central data of formal semantics, which is what I do. So um, the, 
most relevant data in formal semantics are judgment on what we could say semantic properties or relation, things like entailment, inferences, uh, which is a, a relation between sentences, truth, relation between a sentence and a situation, synonymy, ambiguity, and so forth. And then so the minimal pairs that normally we, we can consider as semanticists are things like in nine, when you have John smokes or drinks versus nobody smokes or drinks, and you observe that they have different inference pattern. So from John smokes or drinks, we cannot infer that John smokes. From nobody smokes or drinks, we can infer that uh, nobody smokes. And then the idea is that so if you just look at the syntactic form, a and B have exactly the same form, but there is a difference probably in the meaning of John and nobody. Eh? So we could say, and then we could try to figure out a theory of such a thing, and we say, well, John never gives rise to entailment. Nobody does give rise to entailment. Such a theory would not be very good. Eh? For, for instance, we will find immediately, this is an hypothesis, and we will find immediately new data that was uh, falsified. For instance, we, if we just instead of or we put an end, you have John smokes and drinks, then you can draw the conclusion that John smokes, whereas nobody smokes and drinks. Normally, uh, you cannot conclude that uh, nobody smokes. Okay, so, and then uh, the idea then here is that we just don't only look at the meanings of words, but we also look at how they are combined together. And these are genuine uh, semantic facts uh, that belong to the empirical <coughs> scope of formal semantics, which, is, which deals with meaning composition. Okay, just simple example. Now, one thing, I just want to say one thing on how we do collect this data on judgment. So in the old days, the data were collected by introspection. Nowadays, we uh, use a uh, methodology mostly from uh, psychology, and so and these data are normally collected and checked experimentally. Uh, in the old days, we only looked mostly at English, here in the Netherlands at Dutch. In the Netherlands, there, there have been very many former semanticists already in the 70s. But nowadays, we are also uh, trying to provide the semantics of less accessible languages, and so field work is also among uh, the methods that in formal semantics are used to collect uh, uh, interesting da semantic data. Uh, and then we are also using data from other disciplines, uh, uh, for instance, computer science, and again, uh, neurosciences, so uh, in, uh, for languages for which we have uh, uh, lar large corpora, then we could uh, use corpus study to discover patterns in language usage that then can, um, can be then analyzed uh, semantically. And by using uh, techniques uh, from psychology and the neuroscience, we can also learn something about semantic processing, so how people process uh, uh, sentences and, in, uh, and interpret them. I won't say much about the three and four, well, something about four, uh, but so the, the, the case study I'm going to discuss uh, with is really is about entailment, so we will focus on, on the cases uh, illustrated by nine and ten. Now, let me first uh, say something about the methodology. Uh, we have seen, okay, we collect this data, and then we want to build up a theories that make predictions about this data. We're going to use logic for that. For this example, it's pretty obvious why. Huh? These are examples of inferences, logic, what is the whole purpose of logic, arriving at theory of inferences. So here it's pretty obvious. So normally, so okay, formal semantics uses logic to explain semantic judgment of various kinds, in particular uh, ju judgments on entailment. And now how do we normally proceed? So in 11 to 14, I have the old example. So we have just, uh, examples of judgment in natural languages. People are asked to whether something follows or not, and they give their answer. And then a formal semanticist normally would translate the linguistic examples into a logical language. This is something that maybe you have all even be required in some exams, or you will be required to do in some exams. Uh, and then, so you translate them in, in the logical language, and here I'm using the language of predicate logic that you still haven't 
uh, seen, but somehow th these are complex data. We need a complex logic, the, the language of propositional logic that you, you know uh, is not enough to account for this pattern. So it would be enough to account for two of this example. 11 and 13, in principle, you could account just by propositional logic, but for 12 and 14, you need something more complex. In any case, um, so this is how you, so you translate the example into a logical language, and then you use the rigorous notion of validity of inference that your logic defines to characterize then the notion of entailment at the level of, of the natural language. Uh, so this is, this is an illustration of a methodology that was started by Montague in the 70s. Uh, it's called an indirect method in logical grammar, um, or also semantics via translation. And the idea is that we have a grammar with the first one component, a syntactic component that generates the example uh, in, in the natural language, in this case, English. And then we have a second component, a translation component that translate, that some allows us to translate the, in this case, English example into a logical language in a systematic way. And then we do use the model theory of the logic to uh, make prediction about the original linguistic examples. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the general methodology. Sure. Then there are, of course, many challenges. One, so I think the biggest challenge still in semantics is how to collect this data in a reliable way. And we have made a lot of progress, but still meanings are a difficult uh, uh, object to capture. The second challenge is how to translate natural language expression into a logical language in a systematic and compositional way. Here we really made a lot of progress. We basically know how to do it. But also another question that arises, which logic should we adopt? So, you, so far you have seen two logics, propositional logic, model logic. There are many other around. Which one should we take? And then I will, so I will now move to my case study uh, which can be used to illustrate uh, some of these challenges. In particular, the which logic should we adopt? This is something that uh, at ILRC we do a lot. We develop our own logics, and this is also what I will do at the end to come up with my own logic to try to uh, make the right prediction about some linguistic data. Okay, now let's move now. So this was a general introduction to the field, and now let's move to my case study. And so we're going to, so the free choice, what are these? Um, okay, so in here on the slides, 15 and 16 are classical example of what we call free choice inferences. Now, 15 is from Hans Kamp, let's read it. So, uh, so you may go uh, to the beach or to the cinema. Now, people normally, when they encounter this sentence, they draw the conclusion, you may go to the beach and you may go to the cinema. In 16, a similar example, but with a different modality. This is from Edith Zimmerman. Mr. X might be in Victoria or in Brixton. People normally draw the conclusion, Mr. X might be in Victoria and he might be in Brixton. Okay, here we have example of uh, linguistic inferences. So this is so in the 70s and also in 2000, this judgment were based on introspection. Nowadays, we have run a number of experiments and this judgment are very robust. This is what people really, this, con, this what, how people interpret these sentences. Hmm? Do you agree more or less? Huh? Okay, then so as a semanticist, what the first thing that, that what we have to do, we, we want to try to account for this. And then so first we try to translate it into a logical language. And here, the language of model logic, propositional model logic that you know very well will be enough. Now think, how are we going to translate this example in uh, propositional model logic? I give you two seconds and then I will move on. But just try to think for yourself. You may go to the beach or to the cinema. How would you translate it? Anyone? Ideas? I give you a proposal. Let's see. This is, so the tra in 17, so what is in 17? This is how the, the sentence will be translated in the standard algorithm, uh, 
translation algorithms that are around in formal semantics. Huh? So we get a model operator, a diamond, which stands for a translation of uh, the may and the might. So did you see that the two examples have exactly the same form? Huh? So we can translate them by exactly the same um, logical expression. So we have a may and might that's represented by this diamond and then a disjunction. And then, so this is the first sentence, the A sentence, and then the B sentence, then the, this translation algorithm will, will give us uh, something like this, possible alpha and possible beta as translation. Do you more or less agree with this translation? <coughs> is what you expected? Okay. Now, one thing I want to say first is about the translation of the B sentence. Is that so this is, so we translate this as the possible alpha and possible beta, which is very different from um, possible alpha and beta. Huh? Do you see? That's really a different thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, uh, so for instance, possible alpha and beta will say, for instance, in this case, that you, uh, it should be possible for Mr. X to be both in Victoria and in Brixton at the same time. And this is not what the sentence, what the meaning of the sentence will say. Huh? So this is uh, the way sort of that the logical form help us in clarifying uh, what this linguistic example will mean. Okay, but now 17, an inference. Now, do you think that this inference is valid in classical model logic? No. <laughs> So in classical logic, at, at least uh, I hope that you have used <laughs> classical logic, this is not valid. And, I, and normally, okay, but that's what's nice. So in semantics, there are many things that are vague. In logic, nothing is vague, and we can prove it. How do you prove that something is invalid? Exactly. And we build the counter example. And here it is. And I hope you, all, you understand these pictures. I, could, I don't know which pictures you use. Do you recognize these pictures? And so we have here, the, the, we take W to be the actual word. And then, so, um, and then V is one of the words accessible from W. And we have this arrow here. And then in the circle, we write down the propositional letters that are true in the various model. And so here we have A is true, and here nothing is true, okay? Now, this is a counter model for this argument because it does verify the premise but it falsifies the conclusion. And you can check this at home. Yeah. Now, maybe I show you why, for in, in particular, why the, um, so that this is false in W, I think is easy to see. This says that A is possible and B is possible, but of course B is not possible here because there are no words from which, accessible from W, where B is true, right? You agree with this? On the other hand, uh, why is this uh, true? This is true because, okay, we move here. Um, so this says that there must be an accessible word where this disjunction is true. And then you ask yourself, is this disjunction A or B true here? Yes, it is, because one of the disjunct is true, okay? So this is a simple counter model showing classical model logic would not give us this inference as valid. But in natural language, we find it all around in a very robust way. This is the problem. Let me expand a bit more on this problem. Um, so this, this philosopher, this is a more the philo philosophical uh, slide. The philosopher called this the paradox of free choice. So we have seen, observed that, so and now we are focusing just on permission. So in natural language, if you give a permission, you may do A or B. Normally you can conclude that you may do A. Yeah? But then if we look at the corresponding principle in uh, the ontic logic, here we are looking at principles, not on validities. Huh? We see that this thing, something like 19, is not valid. It's basically you can give a similar counter example, the counter model, the, the one that we just saw. Let's call 19 the free choice principle. Now normally in model logic, I think you have, maybe you have seen various examples of model logic, maybe epistemic logic where you would study the notion of knowledge, deontic logic where you study what is permissible and what is obligatory. Did you do some? 
And normally, so you have a basic model logic, and then uh, suppose you want to develop a model logic which studies, uh, say, knowledge. You look at what are the principles that I want to be valid for knowledge. Huh? For instance, reflexivity. Did you do this thing? And then what do you do? You take the basic model logic and you add the principle as an axiom. Huh? So we could try to do this. We, we have an inference in natural language that is valid. Classical logic, model logic uh, doesn't validate it. Let's try to add it as an axiom. And we'll let's see what we get. So plainly making this principle valid by adding it as an axiom, so something that just by, by brute force holds, would not do. And here is an argument that you will all understand, and it's very nice. Suppose, so this is something that then you, you can prove if you, if you do that. Suppose that you give someone the permission, so you have, uh, it is permitted to do A. Then, uh, by classical reasoning, uh, something that holds in classical model logic, we would derive that it's possible to do A or B. Basically, we, that's the same what, what we did informally by looking at the counter model one slice ago. But then if we are here, if we have such a thing, we can apply this principle and modus ponens, and you get that it's possible to do B. So from a permission whatsoever, you may do A, we can conclude you may do B, completely unrelated thing. This doesn't look like a good logic of permission. Huh? Do you all understand this point? Huh? Okay. Now, the step from one to two, which here I wrote, follows uh, from uh, uh, classical reasoning, uh, uses a principle, one in 21, which I, we can call modal addition, huh? which allows you to go from possible alpha to possible alpha or beta. This is something that is classically valid, and huh? you will see this. Huh? You, you saw this in the previous. But now, if we look at the linguistic counterpart of 21, here it is in 22. So you may A and or inference, you may A or B. This seems to be invalid. Uh, normally, if I tell you, you may post this letter, you normally do not conclude that you may post this letter or burn it, right? Again, this has been called the Ross paradox, one of the forms. And then again, so we have intuitions in natural language that are in direct opposition to the principle of logic. Eh? So this is a challenge. What are we going to do about it? Different strategies, different reaction. So this is again the paradox and eh, the arguments. Okay, so w there are basically normally two classes of solution that are normally considered in the field. One is called pragmatic and the other semantics. So the pragmatic solution will say that the free choice inferences, so for instance the free choice principle, these things are not logical validities, but they are merely conversational implicatures. I will say something more about this. And what are they? These are pragmatic inferences derived not by logic, but by the product of rational interaction between cooperative language users, assuming classical logic, logical meaning. Huh? And then, so if we adopt a pragmatic solution, now, what the step that it doesn't go through in this uh, collapsing ar argument is the one from two to, two to three. Basically, we keep classical logic as is, and we add a component that explains uh, these inferences in a separate way. Hmm? And uh, this, is, this is a pragmatic solution. And the second kind of solution are semantic solution. They take free inferences to be as semantic entailment, so something that the logic should produce. Now, this uh, semantic, uh, this new logic, so what we have to do here is to change the logic. Mm -hmm. And this new logic normally um, would then uh, um, allow the step from two to three, the free choice principle, but then they have to do something about the step from one to two. So they're really non-classical logic, something like modal 
addition will not hold anymore. Huh? Okay, so it's not uh, an easy fix because uh, so you have to really remove things from classical logic. So what I want to do next uh, is first uh, give you a hint of this well, this uh, contribution of Paul Grice. So say something about what conversational implicatures are, because this is one of the great ideas in philosophy of language of last century. So do you know anything about, anyone knows what the conversational implicatures are? So I want to do that, so at least you learn something from, from this. And then uh, we will discuss a bit whether free choice inference, should, they, should we go for the, for the semantic solution or the pragmatic solution? And then I will uh, uh, come with my proposal, which is, well, neither of the two we will say something about it. Okay, so Paul Grice, a British uh, philosopher of language, that's him. Now, so, and, and now I'm going to present uh, this argument um, and his st story about conversational implicatures. And then the starting point of this argument is a problem, which is the problem that we have encountered here and that we are addressing. We have a mismatch between logic and language. Basically, the traditional logical interpretation of some of our linguistic, of, of our words are not enough. Now, he was not looking at the case of free choice that we have considered, he was looking at other examples. Uh, so something like 24, if you, if you hear something like some of the deaths were accidental, normally a user, language user would interpret the sentence as saying some and not all of the deaths were uh, accidental. Um, and therefore, if you hear something like 24, normally you uh, think how oh, we should start an investigation, uh, some of the deaths were not accidental, so we have to do something. However, and now this is something that you may not understand now because you didn't do practical logic, the classical logical rendering of these sentences is, uh, is, is, is a weaker interpretation, is a sum and perhaps all interpretation. Uh, so this is problem number one. Now we discuss a problem which relates to this junction that you will be able to understand and that possibly you bit that you discuss in the, uh, in the lessons, because I also teach uh, uh, logic to philosophy students, and they always come with this point. So I hope that you can relate to this. Take a sentence like, Mary is patriotic or quixotic. Now the intuitive interpretation that uh, natural language speaker normally have of this sentence is the one that corresponds to exclusive disjunction. Do you know the difference between inclusive and exclusive disjunction? Yes. Okay, and I also check this is the notation that you use. Normally, intuitive interpretation, exclusive disjunction, and not both reading, right? But the lo classical logical rendering of this sentence is inclusive disjunction. And then in the exam, if you translate 25 with the exclusive disjunction, you get um, an error, right? Uh, we have the classical logical rendering. Do you, do, can you see the... Do you, do you understand, did you, uh, uh, okay, clear for everyone? Mismatch between classical logic and language. Okay, there are different things that we could do to solve this mismatch. Normally students come with the, the first solution, and maybe it's also yours in the discussion, would be, well, okay, we should adopt a stronger literal meanings. Instead of translating or, with the inclusive disjunction, we should transla translate it with the, the exclusive one. Hmm? This is a solution that I normally hear from students. We should just go for stronger readings. But then uh, uh, Grice noticed a problem for this solution. There is actually evidence for the weaker reading, eh? for the inclusive disjunction reading. Let's just look at the example with disjunction 28. So if you say Mary is patriotic or quixotic, you can cancel the not both interpretation. So you can say Mary is patriotic or quixotic, in fact both. And this is not contradictory, it's perfectly all right. Now if we had translated or with the exclusive disjunction, then we would have predicted a sentence like A to be equivalent to a sentence like B which is odd, which is contradictory. Eh? So we say it's Mary is patriotic or quixotic and not both, in fact both. This is a contradiction, but the Hay sentence is not. 
So actually, or there is not exclusive disjunction, it's the inclusive one, okay? But now you could say, okay, then we have some, sometimes or is inclusive, sometimes or is exclusive. Huh? This also, uh, Grice considered this possibility. It's option two, ambiguity. We place, we have two or in English, an inclusive one and an exclusive one. And then he discussed a number of problems for this solution. The first problem is conceptual, that if we, so if we pose it an ambiguity, we lose uh, explanatory power. So the analysis, so we do, this is a general pattern, so it, it arises with or, it arises with some, it arises with all numerals. So we see this general pattern arising for different construction in most languages. So and if positing an ambiguity is giving up on being a, a, a theorist that wants to, with, uh, wants to have some explanatory power. So this is a conceptual problem, but it also has an empirical problem, this solution of having two or. It makes uh, systematically wrong prediction if we in a negative context. Because in negative context, only the weak or, so the inclusive or interpretation is available, according to speakers. And look at the example 31. Mary didn't drink or smoke. Uh, then we have here or in the scope of, an, of negation. And then we could, this, uh, so this theory would say, well, we have two different translations. One which uses uh, inclusive or, and the other which uses exclusive or. But the problem is that this second one is never attested because it predicts a reading which is not there in natural language. A reading which would be, would be a reading according to which the sentence would be compatible with the possibility that Mary did both things. And that's not how we interpret the sentence. Huh? And this is also shown by the fact that the continuation she did both is not good. Okay, so we make systematically the wrong prediction if we assume that or is ambiguous between these two senses. Okay, and then what was Grice's solution? It was what we call pragmatic strengthening. So this, uh, the stronger meaning, so they're not both, they're not all inferences. They are not part of what is said, so the literal meaning of or or some, but they are infer implicated. They are prag they're derived pragmatically by a different component. So this is the idea, look at 33, Mary's patriotic or quixotic. Then uh, according to Grice, there is what is said, inclusive or meaning. Then there is what is implicated, what follows, but from a different component, not the logical one, the not both interpretation. And then we have this notion of what the speaker means, that is a combination of the two, and then you get to the exclusive or. But just by adopting as a literal meaning of or, the inclusive one, okay. Now what is implicated then, uh, this component, the B thing, follows then from the interplay of weak semantic content, what is said, inclusive or, with general principle of conversation. And now we have to say what this general principle are. Now quickly, so this is how he defines then implicature. A speaker then conversationally implicates what she must be assumed to believe in order to preserve the assumption that she is adhering to the general principle of conversation. Blah. Month, but okay, I will give you now the, uh, the, the intuition. First, uh, something about this, what are these principles of conversation that uh, uh, Grice recognized that plays a role in this derivation? Uh, let's just look at, the, he um, individuates four maxims. The maxim of quantity, which says that you, when you talk, when you in conversation, you should make your contribution as informative as is required. And then there is a second bit, but it's less important. And then the maxim of quality, which says, well, in conversation, you should say what is true. Uh, you should not lie. Uh, you should not say falsity. Okay, keep those in mind. And then here I give you an example of a Gratian reasoning, a Gratian re derivation. How can we derive the not both inference if we start from an inclusive notion of disjunction? The idea, so this is a, a formalization of what a hearer could conclude. So you hear 
something like Mary's patriotic or quixotic, and you want to derive not both by assuming for a, a, a logical analysis of the first sentence, just one with the inclusive or. And then you proceed as follows. You say, well, the speaker said A or B rather than A and B, which would also have been relevant. A and B is more informative than A or B. So, we even as, so from A or B and B in classical logic, we can derive the disjunction. Now, if the speaker had had the information that the conjunction, the stronger meaning, uh, were true, she would have said so by the maximum of quantity, which tells you should be as informative as you can. Then you can go on, but then, then we can conclude that since she didn't use and and she used or, she probably had no evidence that A and B is true. Assuming then that the speaker has, is fully informed, we can then conclude that A and B is false. And there we get to the not both inference. Uh, this you can think about it. Huh? But this, uh, and then so basically, we, and we can reconstruct a similar reasoning also for the sum cases and many other cases. Hmm? So this is a very powerful uh, uh, tool that Grice discovered. Huh? If we uh, want to deal with the mismatch between logic and language, we can keep the logic as is and then account for these additional inferences by means of this reasoning based on interplay between classical logic and general principle of conversation. Okay. Um, now, uh, so th this is very powerful and uh, uh, I, I think I'm going to skip this. But uh, so notice that so the Gratian solution allows <laughs> us to explain all the data we have considered so far. Huh? In particular, the cancellability and the non-embeddability of these inferences, this implicature, for example, under negation. Uh, so I on his analysis, we predict that in the case of Mary didn't drink or smoke, we don't get any additional implicature. We predict the meaning that we want uh, by uh, just assuming inclusive disjunction in the scope of negation and nothing extra arise, and that's because of what classical logic tells us about the relation between uh, disjunction and conjunction. In the scope of negation, so while normally a conjunction is stronger than disjunction, in the scope of negation is the other way around. And this blocks then the Gratian derivation in the case of negative sentences. This is, this is brilliant. So you should really have a closer look at this. This is really a great solution. It's very nice. Mm? Okay, now let's move back to free choice. Gratian's picture is great. We have, uh, uh, but it also involves this clear divide between semantics and pragmatics. We have pragmatic inferences. They are derivable by conversational principle. They are cancelable. They are non-embeddable. And then we have semantic inferences. They are not derivable by conversational principle. They are non-cancelable and they are embeddable. And the number of properties. So we have this clear divide. And then the question is, do you rem still remember the free choice inference we start with? You may do A or B. Therefore, you may do A. Is this semantics or pragmatics? This was an inference that was not valid in classical logic. And now, my view on this, and then I, I won't have the time to argue, is that so these inferences uh, are somehow in between. They are neither purely semantics nor purely <coughs> pragmatics. They are derivable by conversational principle. We can, there have been uh, in the literature many examples of Gratian derivation uh, that allow us to derive them but they do lack other defining properties of conversational implicature. So I call them inferences of the third kind. And then the goal of my project uh, that I've, I've been carrying out with some colleagues and students in the last uh, year is to develop logics of, uh, of these inferences then which capture their hybrid behavior. Uh, so we are going to move to different logics. Um, I just give you an, I'm not going to give you much arguments for this uh, hybrid view, but just show. So this is an example of a scalar implicature, the not both, which has these four 
property, so it's pragmatically derivable. We saw that it is cancelable. You can say the effect uh, both is non-embeddable under negation. And uh, here comes uh, the processing data. It also normally, when a speaker draw this kind of implicature, it, um, they are costly, so it takes uh, time to draw them. Then we have semantics, uh, classical entailments that don't have any of these uh, properties. But then, okay, that if we then move to free choice inferences, we notice that they are pragmatic derivable. Ah, I didn't show you, but uh, there are many uh, ways of deriving them by general principle of con conversation. But their processing cost is very low. Uh, this is how semanticists can use uh, processing uh, experiments. And the cancelability and the non-embeddability facts are very unclear. I had some slides about this, but I will skip them because I want to give you the idea of them, what I'm going to do with this. So I'm sorry, some, uh, some arguments. Um, so well, the conclusion is that, so a purely semantic or pragmatic approach then to this specific free choice inference cannot account for a number of facts. And then I, I want to defend the hybrid approach and the idea is that these inferences are not derived by a pragmatic component that is completely separated from the classical logic component, but we have an integration of a pragmatic principle into the logic, hmm? what I call a pragmatic intrusion. But then the idea is that if we want to model this pragmatic intrusion, we need a logic which is a bit smarter than classical logic. And then I give you an idea of the kind of logic that I'm going to develop. I think that the main idea you will understand it. Then how we can derive free choice inference is maybe too much to understand. So this is what I'm going to present is a state-based semantics of pragmatic in intrusion. So this is a logic I'm working on at the moment. I just give you the main idea. So in this semantics, state-based semantics, the formulas of the logic are interpreted with respect to states rather than, than classical models. I'm afraid that you use the states for possible words, maybe? Okay. But okay. In any case, what, what I mean by states are things that are less determinate entities than classical models. They are less determinate than possible words. Can be interpreted in various ways. What I will do, I will interpret them as information states and I will define them as sets of possible words. And now compare, so in classical model logic, normally what do you do? You interpret a sentence with respect to something, I call it a possible words, you call it a state, that's confusing maybe. Where with this is a one, these are, you interpret the sentences in these models and this W is an element of V, a big W, all right? We call it the possible words normally. Now in this model logic that I'm studying at the moment, we interpret sentences not with respect to a single element, but to a set of possible words. These are what states are. And basically while classical model logic models the truth in possible words, this model logic model supports in an information state. And now this logic, although there are various kinds of state-based uh, semantics and you can define the various notion of logical consequences and the notion of logical consequences, so of validity that you can come up with, can be classical. Still, there is some partiality to this logic and I show you in this way. So um, when uh, is an atom uh, supported by an information state? Well, if and only if uh, for all words, uh, all elements in S, the sentence is true in the word. And when is a negation supported? If uh, for all W element of S, the sentence is false in the word. But then we could have states containing two different possibilities, one in which P holds and one in which P is false. And in such a state, neither P nor not P will be supported. And so we can express partiality, okay? And then the partial nature of this semantics is what uh, makes uh, then this uh, uh, state-based system particularly si uh, suitable to model a number of phenomena, including free choice. And in particular, then the, 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 pragmatic, the, the, 
the pragmatic principle and their intrusion into semantic composition here. And then I give you also all the results. So, how, so we want to formulate pragmatic intrusion. Now, in con so when we have discussed a number of pragmatic principles of conversation. Now, one thing that follows from uh, Gratian's story, for in particular from his maxim of quality, is that there is this principle which tells you that uh, uh, you should avoid the contradiction. Uh, if you're a cooperative user, you should avoid contradiction. Uh, this is a pragmatic principle. It's not a logical principle. It's a pra pragmatic principle. Let's call it like this. Avoid the bottom. <coughs> avoid contradiction. Now, the main insight here of this uh, proposal is that this free choice inferences would follow from the systematic intrusion of such a principle in the recursive process of meaning composition. But then if we want to formal formalize this, we need a, a formula which represents this principle in the logic. Now, in classical logic, so we, to model this intrusion, we need a way to formally represent this principle. Now, in classical logic, how can you express a void contradiction? It's very difficult. Maybe it could be a negation of a contradiction, but then you get a tautology. There is not much you can do with it. So, not contradiction. Then you get a tautology and you're stuck. Now, in this system, this partial system, we have a way to express this principle by means of an expression. We call it NE, non-empty, which requires to be supported that the state is non-empty. This is the whole idea. And then the main result is the following. So by enriching then every formula in the logic with the requirement to satisfy this principle, the idea is that we are really modeling conversation. Speakers speak and they try always to be consistent and we can see it in the logic by means of, we then capture the free choice inferences. And we capture that uh, diamond A or B, after this enrichment, uh, adding this N E all the time, does indeed entail uh, possible A and possible B. And we also get another, uh, so when I tried this, then I got an additional inference, which is called the wide scope free choice inference. So we also got uh, a uh, free choice inference for this co uh, configuration. Uh, with some subtle restriction, and then we did an experiment and actually it confirmed the prediction of the system. So, telling me that we are on the right track. And one thing that you notice uh, that I didn't tell you, but uh, because it was a bit um, that I, I, I skipped, so one strong argument for a pragmatic solution to the free choice um, uh, problem is that under negation, this free choice inference disappear like a classical conversational implicature. And this, this system, we can capture the same. So adding this, uh, um, pragmat this pragmatic intrusion does not have undes undesirable effect, in particular under negation. So we get strong meaning also under negation. Now I'll just show you, uh, this is how then a model will look like. In this, uh, in this system, we have a set of possible words, accessibility relation, this is all very classical, but then we have a special state, a set of words, and with respect to this set of words, we interpret sentences rather than with respect to a single word. That's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs>